you can see around you is made up of atoms. From the clothes you're wearing, to the air you're breathing, to the mouse you're about to use to close this YouTube page. Even the pixels on your screen representing the cursor are made up of atoms. You can't get away. Atoms consist of electrons, orbiting a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. Now, for very many years, the nucleus was thought to resemble a bag full of marbles, with every particle exerting a force on every other, but with the whole still retaining some collective properties. Then, in 1963, Maria Gerpert Meyer and Hans Jensen were awarded the Nobel Prize for proposing that the nucleus, in fact, consisted of a solar system model, with protons and neutrons themselves orbiting a central point. Sharing the Nobel Prize with them in that year was Eugene Wigner, whose theoretical work on particle symmetries was not directly related, but provides much of the mathematical underpinning for the way we look at the nucleus today. 1963 was only the second year that a woman was awarded a share of the Nobel Prize for Physics, but Maria would probably not have made too much of that. She was a scientist, first and foremost, and from childhood was determined to fulfill her potential in an extremely male-dominated field. journey together and imagine that the year is 1943. The United States is less than two years into the Second World War and the race is on to build a new, more powerful type of weapon that will bring the conflict to a speedy conclusion. The three physicists who 20 years later would share a stage in Stockholm have all been drafted in to help produce that all-important first nuclear bomb. Maria Gerpert Meyer in New York, Eugene Wigner in Chicago, and Johannes Hans Daniel Jensen in Hanover. The story of German science under Nazi rule is a fascinating one, and the topic we'll return to later in future episodes. The distinction between patriotic German and rabid Nazi becomes uncomfortably blurred throughout these years, compounded by the fact that all public officials were required by law to join the Nazi party if they wanted to keep their jobs. Hans Jensen, a theoretical physics professor at the University of Hanover was, by all accounts, a socialist with highly left-wing political inclinations. He became a reluctant member of the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei in 1937, as late as it was possible to keep his job, and maintained contacts with the underground movement throughout the war. According to Michael Frame's play Copenhagen, he is portrayed as a concerned German, keen to smuggle information about the burgeoning nuclear project out of the country. Unfortunately, Jensen's reputation as a socialist meant that he was excluded from the inner circle of German nuclear engineers, often called the Uranverein, or Uranium Club, a group that included the future Nobel laureate Werner Heisenberg, and so Jensen would not have been privy to any information worth smuggling. After the war, the need for experienced professionals to help rebuild Germany meant that in many cases problematic wartime behaviour was simply swept under the rug. Jensen's track record soon rehabilitated him in the eyes of the authorities, however, and he retained his position at Hanover. It was in this capacity that one day while shaving he had the insight into the structure of the nucleus that would win him the Nobel Prize, an insight arrived at almost simultaneously by Maria Gerpert Meyer on the other side of the Atlantic. Gerpert Meyer and Jensen had a surprising amount in common. Not only did they share the same Nobel Prize for work they carried out at the same time, but their birthdays were just three days apart. According to Joseph Ferry, Jensen would sign his letters to her, Your Twin Brother. But as Ferry also claims they shared a birthday, I'd take that with a pinch of salt. Maria was also a German national, born in what was then the German town of Katowice, now in southern Poland and called Katowice. She was descended from six generations of professors on her father's side and from a young age was determined to be the seventh. When her family moved to Göttingen in 1910, the four-year-old Maria found herself at the beating heart of the physics universe. Anyone who was anyone in the emerging discipline of quantum mechanics either taught or studied at Göttingen in the interwar years, and as many of them were friends of her parents, the young Maria got to meet them all. It wasn't long before she decided she wanted to study mathematics at the university, and even though her school shut down a year before it had finished preparing her for the entrance exam, she passed with ease. Or rather, she passed with A's. 
Soon after starting her mathematics course, however, the future Nobel laureate Max Born invited her to attend one of his physics seminars. She was hooked, later saying, mathematics began to seem too much like puzzle solving. Physics is puzzle solving too, but of puzzles created by nature, not by the mind of man. Apart from one term spent at Cambridge, she would remain at Göttingen until completing her doctorate in 1930. Eugene Wigner, who alongside Gerpert and Jensen would be the third recipient of the 1963 Nobel Prize, described her thesis as a masterpiece of clarity and concreteness. It was later in the same year that she married Joseph Meyer, an American physicist who was boarding with the Gerperts while completing his studies at Göttingen. The two hiked, skied and played tennis together, with Joseph describing her as a terrible flirt for the loveliest and brightest girl I had ever met. When Joseph was offered a job teaching at the prestigious Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, the young couple decided to relocate across the Atlantic. It was time to go to America. Life in the New World at first proved disappointing for Maria. Employment laws in the years following the Great Depression meant that only one spouse could be employed by a given institution, and so the highly qualified Maria Gerpert Meyer was forced to accept a voluntary position as an assistant in the Johns Hopkins Physics Department. Among her duties was delivering lectures to graduate students. One young man who attended those early lectures recalled them as being dense, technical, organized, and fast-paced, leaving her audience both in awe and slightly terrified. In 1939, Joe was forced to leave Johns Hopkins and took up a position at Columbia University in New York. Maria was once again reduced to being what biographer Joan Dash has called a fringe benefits wife, unable to get a permanent position and forced to rely on the department's generosity for the occasional lecture. Then, in 1941, she applied for a teaching position at Sarah Lawrence, a prestigious girls-only college about a half-hour's train journey from the city. The school was in a real bind, as their former mathematics teacher, the unfortunately named Mr. Belcher, had left at the end of the first term. Kids can be so cruel. Some of the teaching staff felt that Maria lacked the necessary experience for the role, but given her academic credentials, it would have been mad not to take her on. If the faculty were hoping for a quiet substitute teacher who would settle in without rocking the boat, they were soon to be sorely disappointed. Gerbert Meyer felt that the current syllabus gave the girls barely enough scientific training to read the science pages of a popular daily newspaper and proposed a radical shift of emphasis. In later life, she recalled a confrontation with the college's president, Constance Warren, who felt that the girls, who were doubtless destined for lives of quiet domesticity, didn't need to know about these highfalutin concepts. Maria's response has become legendary. Do we teach them English so they can read a cookbook? By this time, America was at war, and nuclear physicists across the country were quietly being lured away from their day jobs to work on mysterious government business. On September 22, 1943, a letter arrived at Sarah Lawrence requesting that Maria Gerpert Meyer be allowed to do her duty for Uncle Sam. In this case, Sam stood for the Substitute Alloy Materials Project, the inoffensive name for a top-secret initiative at Columbia whose aim was to enrich uranium for use in a potential bomb. Maria was now working on the outskirts of the Manhattan Project, the code name given to the American attempt to build an atomic bomb. Her work was so secret that she could not even tell her husband what she was doing, although he himself was also engaged in similar work. In the spring of 1945, she spent a few months at the Los Alamos facility in New Mexico, where many of her acquaintances from her Göttingen days, such as Edward Teller and Robert Oppenheimer, were on the verge of achieving a successful detonation. Her old mentor, Max Born, was one of the few nuclear physicists in America who refused to participate on moral grounds, and his strong position must have rubbed off onto Maria. She had mixed feelings about her involvement throughout the war, and according to her biographers, would later take pride in having played such a small part in the project. In August of 1945, the United States Air Force dropped two atomic devices on the towns of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands and bringing the Second World War to an end. With their wartime projects disbanded, Joseph and Maria were at a loose end, and decided to move the family, which now included two young children, to Chicago. There, Maria once again undertook voluntary teaching work with her wartime supervisor, Edward Teller. Their timing was impeccable. Four months later, in July 1946, the government opened the Argonne National Laboratory on the outskirts of Chicago. The ANL, as it is still known today, 
had as its mission research in basic science and the development of peaceful uses of nuclear power. Someone with Maria's experience was quite a catch, and she was immediately offered a position as senior physicist in the theoretical physics division of the laboratory, her first tenured research role since coming to America 16 years earlier. At Argonne, Maria worked alongside Teller in answering one of the most fundamental questions in science. Where do the chemical elements come from? Atoms of each element are made up of negatively charged electrons spinning around a nucleus, containing positively charged protons and neutrons, which as the name implies, carry no charge. Atoms with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes of the same element and can sometimes have very different chemical and physical properties. As part of her job at Argonne, investigating the origins of the chemical elements, Maria was examining the list of all known stable isotopes and noting how many protons and neutrons each one had. What she soon noticed was that the same numbers kept cropping up. These numbers were 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82 and 126, and for some reason, having either protons or neutrons in these quantities was a guaranteed ticket to nuclear stability. These numbers had been known about, and had gone unexplained, for some time. Physicists found them so irritating that they disparagingly referred to them as magic numbers, owing to their unknown origin, an appellation which has stuck to this day. Atoms with magic numbers of protons or neutrons were themselves said to be magic, whereas any atom that had a magic number of protons as well as a magic number of neutrons, and was even more stable, was said to be doubly magic. Tin, the element with a magic number of 50 protons, for example, could exist in any of 10 stable isotopes, whereas antimony, with the unmagic number of 51 protons, only had 2. Likewise, there existed five different atoms that had the magic number of 50 neutrons, whereas there was only one that had 51. The reason for this pattern had eluded scientists ever since the 1920s, when a German physicist by the name of Elsasser proposed an intriguing hypothesis. The periodic stability of the nucleus reminded Elsasser of the periodic table of the elements, which is arranged in columns according to the arrangement of electrons in the atom. Electrons orbit the nucleus in concentric shells, which are at their most stable when completely full. In fact, those elements with completely full outer shells, such as those over here on the right-hand side, are so stable that they barely interact with any other atoms, a supercilious attitude which has earned them the nickname of noble gases. Now, I don't want to be rude, but could you please get out? Elsasser went out on a limb and wondered if a shell model of the nucleus, with neutrons and protons travelling in orbits just like the electrons did in the atom, could help explain away the magic numbers. The idea that neutrons and protons could also be travelling in orbits, however, seemed absurd. To use a famous analogy, if electrons travelled in orbits the size of this hall, then the nucleus would be the size of a fly at the centre. How could particles trace out coherent orbits in a space so small without constantly colliding with each other? The answer to that can best be explained by thinking about a hotel. Each room can only accommodate a certain number of guests before it becomes full. Once all the cheapest rooms are taken, the next guests have no choice but to check into one of the more expensive rooms instead. In this context, the hotel's price brackets can be thought of like shells, the cheaper rooms at the centre of the nucleus will fill up first, and only once they have no other choice will tourists be willing to jump up to the next bracket. That means the hotel will be at its most stable when a given price bracket is full. Nobody staying in the hotel feels like they're being overcharged for their room, and no new guests are going to want to be the first ones paying more than they need to. Elsasser's proposed model for the nucleus hotels was promising. He arranged the mathematics so that the lowest price bracket could accommodate two people, the next one up six, and the third one up twelve, meaning that the hotel would be at its most stable when it had two, eight, or twenty guests, perfectly matching the first three magic numbers of the nucleus. According to Elsasser's blueprints, however, the next numbers should be 40, 70, and 112, meaning that as tempting as the shell theory was, it just didn't tally with the experimental evidence. Clearly, a different model was needed to fully explain the structure of the nucleus, which is where Maria Gerpert Meyer comes in. Now, epiphanies are often hard to pinpoint in the moment they happen. 
Many of the great scientific eureka moments are tidy fictions invented after the event to give journalists and communicators like myself an easy way into the story. In this case, however, less than a year after Maria had begun examining the question of magic numbers, there appears to be little controversy over what actually took place. Excuse me for one moment. In early 1949, Maria was presenting her results to Enrico Fermi, one of the inventors of the first nuclear reactor and a senior staff member at Argonne. Hello, who is this? She and her husband, Joe, were in Fermi's office when Fermi was suddenly called out to answer a long-distance telephone call. Oh, I see what's going on. Clever. Just as he was about to leave the room, he turned and asked what he thought was a throwaway question. When he came back to the office less than ten minutes later, Maria was convinced she had solved the problem and began throwing suggestions at Fermi with her usual rapid-fire delivery. Hold on, you, you haven't even said what the question was. Fermi, who preferred his physics delivered slowly and calmly, smiled and said, Tomorrow, when you are less excited, you can explain. What was the question? Hello? Hello? What was... Uh, hi? The question Fermi had asked was, is there any evidence of spin-orbit coupling? In other words, does the spin of each individual neutron and proton around its own axis interfere in any way with its orbit around the nucleus? The simple answer is yes. Very much so. Maria herself, with a nod to her Germanic heritage, compared the situation to couples in a waltz. Now, I'm a little bit underdressed for a waltz, but then again, so is she. If all the dancers are moving in a clockwise orbit around the room, any couple also spinning clockwise is going to have a much easier time keeping balanced than a couple spinning in the opposite direction. This means the nucleons whose spin lines up with the direction of their orbit will be much more stable and harder to dislodge, the equivalent of a guest staying in a cheaper room. What Maria's model had done was split each room into two, representing the two possible spin states of each nucleon, and thereby forcing hotel managers to rearrange the price brackets accordingly. Sure enough, once this little tweak was added to the nuclear model, the magic numbers emerged exactly as needed. Maya was keen to publish her findings as soon as possible, and on February 4, 1949, submitted a letter to the editor of the Physical Review. Word soon reached her that a more complete paper was due to be published by a rival physicist on the same subject, and so out of courtesy to the authors, she asked the editor to hold her letter back until the June issue of the journal, when the rival paper was scheduled to come out. Meanwhile, less than ten days later, Hans Jensen and his colleagues Otto Haxel and Hans Zeus had submitted a letter of their own to a German publication called Die Naturwissenschaften. They would go on to submit two more over the coming months, switching their names around as authors so that all three would get joint credit for the discovery. On April 18th, they decided their work was sufficiently advanced to be worth spreading to an English-speaking audience, and submitted a letter to the Physical Review, the same journal Maria had approached two months previously. Jensen placed no restrictions on the publication of their paper, however, and so while the German paper was published in the Physical Review on June 1st, Maria's initial generosity meant that her original submission didn't see the light of day until two weeks later. As only one of many theories proposed at the time to explain the magic numbers, acceptance of the spin-orbit coupling hypothesis was not immediate. Nonetheless, it was not long before the merits of the model were recognised. Wolfgang Pauli, one of the great cynics of 20th century physics, was so amused by Maria's constant attempts to compare the structure of the nucleus to the concentric shells that are found in a common household vegetable that he affectionately dubbed her the Madonna of the Onions. On paper, Meyer and Jensen had no shortage of reasons to hate each other. The two had been on opposite sides of the war and now were forced to share credit for the same idea. Despite all that, their shared passion and complementary personalities allowed them to develop a firm friendship over the coming decades. The two visited each other regularly, jointly wrote a landmark physics textbook on the structure of the nucleus, and in 1963 were both invited to Stockholm to share the Nobel Prize for Physics. Much has been made of the media coverage that Meyer's Prize received. 
By 1963, Maria and Joe were living in sunny California, where Maria was a professor at the University of San Diego and one of 12 Nobel laureates across the faculty of the University of California. This is a blow-up of the front page of the San Diego Evening Tribune, one of the Myers local papers, dated Tuesday, November 5th, 1963, kindly sent across to me by staff at the San Diego Public Library. As you can see, the headline chosen to accompany the announcement of Maria Gepard Meyer's Nobel Prize on the front page of the paper is S.D. Mother wins Nobel Physics Prize. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to examine all the Heidelberg papers to see if there's an equivalent announcement for Jensen, but I'm willing to bet that childless local man wins Nobel Prize, or the German equivalent, will not be the way any of them chose to cover the story. As outrageous as that headline is, I can't help feel that San Diego Union, a rival newspaper, made a bigger faux pas by placing one of their articles on the subject in their women's section, right underneath a pseudo-scientific puff piece about anti-women who prioritize their careers ahead of their families and are thereby endangering the species. In the long and glorious history of the Nobel Prize, only 44 women have had the opportunity 13 in literature, 15 in peace, 10 in medicine, 1 in economics, 3 in chemistry, if you exclude Marie Curie, who also was one of the two in physics. But the absurdity of the ratio doesn't end there. Both Marie Curie in 1903 and Maria Gopert Meyer 50 years later won only a quarter of their respective Nobel Prizes for their contributions to physics. Of 113 prizes awarded to 195 individuals in the years of the Physics Nobel Prize, only one half of a prize was awarded to women. In Maria Meyer's year, while she and Jensen received a quarter each, the other half of the prize went to one of the great figures of quantum mechanics, the Hungarian physicist Eugene Wigner. Wigner has been described by all who knew him as one of the most polite, courteous and self-effacing men they had ever known. One day, in a fit of rage at either a cafeteria attendant or a driver, depending on whose memory you trust, the harshest words he could bring himself to utter were, would you go to hell, please? His willingness to push himself away from the limelight was almost parodic in its intensity, and traces of it can even be found in his own Nobel lecture. It is perhaps due to this characteristic and highly effective self-deprecation that his reputation has never quite made it into popular culture. But within the scientific community, he has become something of a legend. According to his colleague Alvin Weinberg, he was half a dozen physicists rolled into one. He has been called the first nuclear engineer, and he is often credited with introducing the mathematics of group theory into particle physics, one of the most significant and bitterly resented innovations in the history of the field. His presence has even been felt in the shadows throughout this story, lurking beneath the surface but never quite visible. In the 1920s, Wigner was one of the young men working alongside Maria Gopert Meyer in Göttingen, soaking up the unique atmosphere on the front lines of the quantum revolution. In the 1930s, Wigner was the one who coined the term magic numbers to refer to this baffling sequence. And in the 1940s, he and a friend drove out to Albert Einstein's holiday home in Rhode Island and persuaded him to write a letter to President Roosevelt outlining the importance of nuclear energy, kick-starting what would become the Manhattan Project. Perhaps owing to this multiplicity of achievements, Wigner's Nobel citation is one of the vaguest on record. It simply says he won the award for the discovery and application of fundamental symmetry principles. The details of those symmetry principles go beyond the scope of this episode and indeed most physics degrees, but we'll return to them in context in a future episode. Wigner had to wait nearly 30 years for his most significant discovery to be deemed worthy of the Nobel Prize. Jensen and Gopert Meyer had to wait 14. Such long intervals are common among the scientific Nobel Prizes, as the reputation of the Nobel Foundation itself would come into question if it rewarded work prematurely. This can be hard to square with the provision in Alfred Nobel's will that the award go for work that had been carried out in the preceding year. One year when the Nobel Committee came close to matching this speedy turnaround time was in 1930, when the prize was awarded for work published only two years earlier and was described by some as the first experiment to prove the validity of quantum mechanics. The circumstances were exceptional, as was the individual who benefited from them. An Indian physicist who was the first to explain why the sea is blue.
But don't feel you have to wait a whole two weeks longer to enjoy more 66mm wide. There are three great episodes already up on the YouTube channel, and plenty of allegedly humorous shorts for you to sink your teeth into while waiting for those dancing cat videos to buffer. Thank you so much to all those of you who have watched and subscribed so far. We've crossed the 400 views mark, so only 2 billion more to go to beat Gangnam Style. Yes, it's been nearly 2 years and Gangnam Style is still the most watched video on YouTube. There's a Nobel Prize in store for anyone who can explain that. You can subscribe below or follow us on Twitter for regular updates, or you can be charmingly retro and visit the WordPress site. I've seen the Google Analytics and I know at least one of you likes to drop in. Until next time, take a reasonable amount of care and peace to a certain extent out.